time so just as a reminder we are right in the middle of the uh, this big book brothers K uh, on uh, book 7 uh, which is book is named after the youngest brother Alexei um, for the benefit who hasn't been here before we started uh, at the very beginning by saying that the whole book has three themes that go throughout every chapter and you know every scene and so on and so forth uh, the first one is uh, basically apology of Christianity uh, because it was written at the end of the 19th century and uh, we went through all these scientific uh, discoveries and inventions and everything that was uh, basically transforming this uh, the world uh, then so what Dostoevsky was trying to achieve one of the th three main things he was trying to achieve in the book is to uh, uh, show that even in the age of science Christianity is still relevant uh, and maybe even more relevant and, uh, and important than before. Uh, the second main theme is that if you uh, uh, accept the thesis, thesis that you know God exists and, and, uh, and there is a place for religion, then his second goal is to uh, basically what in his opinion to clean Christianity from the pagan uh, influences that uh, infected it through the ages, through the 2000 years that since the coming of Christ uh, and his main issue is people believing in rituals and magic more than having the real faith uh, and uh, this, this, this is addressed throughout the book as well, that's the second main thing, if we uh, want to believe in God if we think that the Christianity is the only thing uh, that you know is suitable for human beings and is true then we want to get to the essence we want to get rid of all the uh, basically extra and, and non-relevant stuff that piled on top of it throughout the history so that's the second and the third main theme is uh, he's looking into what is a human being how uh, you know what makes us human how what's the maybe it's not a good word but what's the mechanism how humans work and he departs from <coughs> basically through most of the history where you know since Plato uh, we had uh, accepted view and especially you know uh, Descartes that there is a dualism that there is a uh, some sort of body separate from the soul and those are two different entities and human being is associated only with one either we're just this pure soul or as some would say we're just this body uh, and there is no soul so he goes back to, uh, it's a famous uh, French uh, mathematician, uh, Pascal, who was basically in the West one of the first thinkers to say that, you know, human has both. 
the good and the bad and the com and the combination this this uh, conflict of two opposite sides is what actually is the essence of of being human and therefore no human being is simply bad or simply good simply noble or simply you know low and the characters all the characters in the book have four versions of this conflict internal conflict that's going on uh, one is to deny that there is this spiritual part uh, to get busy in uh, daily routine or uh, you know in uh, like socialization and uh, distractions that's the good word so there is this type of personality who is busy with distracting himself or herself from having to face uh, herself or, or, or himself having to face this conflict inside of them and each type of each of the four types there is a female character and there is a male character so the male character uh, that fits this this type of personality is the father of the family the the elder Karaman then uh, there is uh, the second type is uh, basically embodied by the middle son Ivan uh, is a human being who says like like ancient Greeks philosophers or like some Protestant uh, movement in Christianity would say as far as we are human we are this good white noble part and everything uh, you know, lowly, everything that is not noble, we just need to cut it off and get rid of it, get rid of it. We can be, basically it leads uh, in the famous part of the book, uh, which is the legend of the great inquisitor, it leads to this sort of human think thinking about themselves as being gods, that they're able to be so good as to uh, completely uh, match uh, the uh, image the image of God and so then th the second type is uh, uh, the oldest son or the third type the oldest son Dmitri who acknowledges that there is good and bad the, the dark and, and, and light in himself but he has uh, such a basically it's such a broad spectrum he says I'm at the same time an angel and their uh, insect, or he would call phrase it in terms of Sodom and Madonna, so like the the sin city that was burned down, and then you know the mother of God. So he, so therefore, since it's uh, he, you know he embraces that yes, there are both ends in him, but it is such a broad spectrum, and he is trying to bring it all together by himself without the help of God. And therefore, he has to uh, carry his cross and uh, and basically, you know, suffer uh, greatly uh, throughout the book until uh, he actually turns to God for help and acknowledges that doing this by himself only caused him in trouble. And uh, so, finishing it off, the fourth character is the youngest son. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the fourth type of uh, personality is the youngest son, Alexei. We've been talking about this chapter started last time. He also knows that to be a human, it takes, you know, there is both in us, you know, good, good and bad, but he's, uh, he's basically so happened that he was under the guidance of the uh, monk, the spiritual father, who uh, will talk about it today, what he did to him, how he transport, transformed him to allow to go into the world and, and have and, and successfully combine this conflicting uh, personality inside. So that's pretty much the gist of, uh, uh, I think it's good even for those who have been uh, faithfully coming for the past two months to remind us uh, because you know it's easy to lose under the you know the details of uh, each chapter but these things 
those are the main things that run, you know, from page one to the last page. This is the the whole purpose why he wrote the he wrote this book. That was his uh, his goal to try to do those uh, three things. And last time uh, we left off where he was uh, also in the book. So. He, what he does, he tries to uh, provide for each sacrament or tradition that we have in the church. He has, he, he's trying to provide some sort of existential meaning from our daily life. So last time we finished off uh, uh, by talking about that in the book there are characters who play the role of uh, angel and devil. So for him, angel and devils are not just uh, spiritual things or some uh, non-material thing. Angel and, and devils are actual people who tilt us in the good direction or in the bad direction, and therefore one and the same person can act sometimes as a devil and some, sometimes uh, as an angel. And so the devil basically tempted Alexei because he was uh, in such a despair because he was expecting a supernatural miracle from the elder who died that the, the human devil seized the moment to uh, come to him when he was at his lowest and uh, tempted him to first to break the fast and eat the sausage and then to drink some uh, alcohol and finally he said, okay, let's go see this woman I know. And uh, this is where we uh, uh, left off last time. And uh, <coughs> we also said that Alexei was in despair because he was looking for supernatural miracle and it didn't happen for objective natural reasons. Uh, but right now we will look at the miracle the, well, the miracle that doesn't require breaking of the uh, laws of chemistry or physics. So this is this is Dostoevsky's view of this is the real miracle that is available for us. Well, that God performs, but is available for us to participate in pretty much uh, every uh, moment uh, in life and. <coughs> So this come, they come to this woman, and she is an, um, uh, well, I would say a desperate si situation. She's in a destructive contradiction. She put her so happen. She is in such situation in her life where she sees two choices, which you know she must choose, but either one of them is bad. So she has to go back to her old lover. Uh, who you know destroyed her reputation and her first choice she says on page 354 if, if you're using the same book uh, that she will go back to him as a dog dog and crawl and and lose all her dignity and sort of beg him to take her back or the other option that she is thinking for herself that she will take a knife and kill him and obviously, if either one, either way she goes, she will destroy herself. If not physically, but for surely spiritually. Uh, so to speak, you know, she will commit a spiritual suicide because she will not be able to live with herself in in either in either case. <coughs> so Dostoevsky deliberately constructed a situation for her where it would seem that literally only a miracle could save her from this situation because if she goes by conventional ways you know she's destroying herself uh, in either one <coughs> and when uh, Alexia arrives uh, it's page 349 on uh, on in, in this book. So when Alexia arrives, and we know from early uh, early chapters that one one of his characteristics, whenever when he was in school, whenever 
people started talking about women, you know, like in high school and, and, and things like that, he would cover his eyes and go into the corners because, you know, he was uh, trying to avoid and sh shut himself off from ever like thinking or being affected or touching that part of the world around us ever. Be because I guess he was sensing that like all his brothers and his father, they were all infected with this passion uh, for women. So he was trying to, you know, just avoid that. So when <coughs> he comes to this woman, first thing she does, as he sat down on the couch, she jumps on, on, on uh, his knees. And this is what, uh, this is what happened. I usually get uh, people to read for me, uh, but I want uh, these uh, the newcomers all sort of go <laughs> where you usually read it. Uh, <coughs> Nevertheless, despise, despite all the vague unaccountability of his state of soul, and all the grief that was weighing on him, he still could not help marveling at a new and strange sensation that was awakening in his heart. This woman, this horrible woman, not only did not ar arouse in him the fear he had never felt before, the fear that used to spring up in him every time he thought of a woman, if such a thought flashed through his soul, but on the contrary, this woman of whom he was afraid most of all who was sitting on his knees and embracing him now aroused in him suddenly quite a different, unexpected and special feeling. The feeling of some remarkable, great and most pure-hearted curiosity. And without any fear, now without a trace of the former terror, that was the main thing and it could not but surprise him. Thank you. And <coughs> I mean, the worst thing that is happening to uh, English and uh, Russian languages is, um, which is, of course, Dostoevsky was writing in Russian, is the <coughs> single word love that we both have to describe very different phenomena. So, for example, in Greek, they had at least three, some, you could say four, different words, not with the same root, but completely different words to describe all the different meanings of love that there are. As there is like brotherly love, there is uh, eros love between sexes, there is, <coughs> finally, we arrived 2,000 years ago, at this new word, which uh, basically in uh, uh, Saint John, the the, uh, the writer of the uh, gospel says, using this Greek word, that love is God. Theos, os, uh, I won't speak Greek, but this is basically what what he says that that not that God has love or. God is love is with God somehow, but this is you know this is it you know God is love, and this word even though even like it, it Homer used it in certain con contexts it wasn't before the Christianity before uh, Gospels wasn't used to describe you know love as as a certain relations so basically we could say that the Christian community were the first ones to use it and give it this specific, uh, more narrow meaning. This, there is this, this certain kind of love, you know, that is equivalent to God, you know, if, if we follow, if we follow St. John, the, uh, the gospel writer. <coughs> but unfortunately, in English, everything is love, 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 and, and then in Russian, it's the same. Um, and actually, Dostoevsky plays on it. Uh, I think there are at least three or four episodes, starting in the beginning, where they, when they they are in the monastery, and the father of the family starts to argue with the monks, saying that oh, you know, this the God 
will forgive this woman because she loved but then the monk said no, no this is not this this kind of love that that you know god forgives for and um, there are other uh, instances uh, well i will when i remember i'll, I'll tell you uh, <coughs> so basically he is conscious conscious of the fact that if he says you know that Alexei had love for this woman that we most likely will be confused and may put a wrong meaning into all of this so what in Russian this he uses word that in English is equivalent to curiosity but what it actually means is to look is to have the feeling of love and at the same time to see something that nobody saw before in something or in somebody that's uh, the like literal translation of the curiosity from russian but it also has the same root as the word love in, in russian so here yes. this is you know very important passage in what accomplished by Alexei in this instance and basically what happened is that instead of his usual you know he was afraid of the woman and he wanted or you know kind of shut him off he for the first time in there seeing each other uh, he had this specific feeling feeling of a god to love towards towards her am I clear don't want to confuse anybody because th so therefore this is why he also just before that verb he had to use three qualifiers that it's remarkable it's great and most pure hearted you rarely say those things about just simple curiosity therefore you know the curiosity is unfortunate word that the translator had to use where the actual meaning is to have this specific feeling of love similar or equivalent to agape love that we use in Christianity uh, <coughs> so what's coming next also what happened for the first time and, and, and Grushenko this woman tells him that before whenever you know she was kind of looking up at him hoping because he was such a sort of moral authority uh, to uh, to people and because he was he was afraid of this sexual feeling towards women that he had every time they would be in the same room or you know she would see him he would turn away and would avoid even looking at her but she would interpret this behavior as that he despised her that he had bad feelings about her and so this is where he shows that one and the same person so he, before this incident he was a demon for her he was you know tormenting her soul she was uh, well I'll, I'll read uh, directly what uh, what what she says about that it's on the next page on the uh, 50. Uh, I keep thinking uh, how a man like him must de despise a bad woman like me. I think I lost it. Uh, <coughs> well, anyway, so both two two things happened in that instance. He looked at her differently. She didn't feel despised. Uh, she didn't feel like you know she is too low for him to look to look at her. And at the same time, he had this you know special specific feeling uh, that uh, he expressed. And this is uh, this is what happened afterwards. Uh, so before she had this destructive choice, 
either s move she makes is is go you know is is gonna have a bad outcome for her. At that very moment, another human being comes in and transmits and relate this this you know this Christian uh, type of love for that person. And then what happens to her that she is reborn and she her life situation is transformed. She is no longer looking at her world and saying these are the only two choices that I have. And she said, no, I actually would be able, so, you know, all of a sudden then she, she sees a third possibility that I will go and forgive that person and will move on with my life without taking revenge, without submitting to him, but realizing that, you know, I have a value by myself and, you know, I'll forgive I'll forgive whatever wrong, wrong doing that that uh, she did to me, and you know we'll go with the Dmitri, the oldest brother, and uh, we'll try to be happy uh, on my own. <coughs> so this option wasn't accessible to her before Alexi came in, before this whole situation unraveled, uh, and this is. Uh, the type of miracle which clearly did not require any supernatural uh, event to take place. It did not break any laws of physics or chemistry. Yet, it literally transformed the life of a person and transformed the possibilities. And, and, uh, and God as love acted in that, in that instance. You say the word curiosity, I mean, not curiosity, but the agape, I think you're talking about curiosity is more like a deep insight. Well, <coughs> as I said, there is, there is this meaning in, in, well, at least in the Russian version, is that you see something that everybody else was overlooking before, that all of a sudden in in certain object or in a certain person you see some you know predicates that people either didn't pay attention to or th thought insignificant but all of a sudden you saw the significance so the word fascination maybe helps in a way the maybe attraction of something that wasn't there before and you, it gets revealed to you in a way yeah and and again uh, yeah. unfortunately it's hard to Will it will be impossible to match it completely because at the same time the curiosity in Russian has the same root as love. Yeah. So they are similar. They have a similar root, uh, and you know it's hard to find it. But even in the prayer of Saint Ephraim that we do in uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Vesper liturgy, he has these two loves that you know. Uh, one is bad and one is good, and we have to like translate them with uh, very different words, like charity. Probably charity would be a mm -hmm. good one instead of curiosity. That's that's the, that's the kind of love or or the kind of thing of feeling that actually uh, happened there. Would you say of the Holy Spirit? Oh, definitely. And we'll we'll get more about that because. Again, since the Gospel of John is the main driving force of this book, it you know it starts with uh, you know if the seed is does not die, you know then it's wasted. But if it does, it's reborn and gives the the, the Lord of fruit. That's that's the like the main slogan of the whole book. And this whole idea that you know God is not some Again, I'm talking about Dostoevsky. I'm not talking about orthodox doctrine or dogma that you know we, we learn or you know the symbol of faith that, that we recite. But for him, it's not some supernatural being, but it's this exactly you know this God is love. It's it's experienced in our everyday relationship if we are open to it and. and and you know we we put our effort into it, so we we we'll, we'll get a window to experience God during our lifetime. Okay, uh, 
now that we're done with that and again if you are not convinced that you know he's talking about the miracle then you get as which is quite common with him then you get the actual the main devil in the book who knows everything who comes in and tells you exactly what happened in case you uh, missed it so this is the last pa last page of chapter three where it was taking place it's page 358 at the bottom so rakitin the embodiment of the dark side says so you converted a sinful woman he laughed spitefully to Alyosha turn the halot in onto the path of truth drove out the seven devils huh so here's where today's expected miracles took place again so he doesn't want you like with important stuff he doesn't want you to miss it so he tells you exactly what's uh, what's been going on you know so you have you have no doubt about that <coughs> and now we can jump to the onion story which is uh, was buried in the middle of this chapter and then we'll go to miracles and Cana of Galilee and for those who doesn't know what the onion story is? You do. <laughs> so this is it's uh, it's uh, oh this was about uh, uh, angels and devils. This is another uh, uh, chart. have this one oh, it turns out yeah oh, this yes, is I, me I meant the other this story is basically uh, you know I will not repeat it but it's just a like it's actually a folk tale uh, that he uses to convey this idea because in a few pages we'll see the like how he shows the existential meaning of the what is it Greek word when they uh, 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 enthrone the bishops uh, uh, Hiero something Hierotonia. Yeah. Right? Right, yes. Basically the, the idea of the apostolic succession. The idea that from the time of Jesus and the apostles, what we have and what is one of the distinguishing features of the apostolic of the uh, orthodox apostolic church is that we can trace you know from those apostles to the very bishop that we have right now at every step you know there was a live human link of the bishop of the of the apostle and the, the next bishop mm -hmm. and the bishop after him that they were they all sort of connected through touch that there was <coughs> somebody going all there was always somebody going all the way back to the apostles that we in our generation are able to witness well the first prism that ever existed in human, human history was in the Ark of the Covenant which are the dreams in that succession mm -hmm. in the Ark of the Covenant and so from the time of the apostles on, they created this prism, which is what, which is what they use for anointing, and uh, so that's part of the whole legend. All right. Well, <coughs> here I'll, I'll uh, move on. Uh, so with this story, uh, you know, it's just basically important to keep it in mind. You know, 
she is talking about it as a sort of path to salvation, meaning saying that, well, you know, you can only, it's, you know, as long as you did one good deed in your life, you have a hope of salvation and so on and so forth. So after all this, you know, Alexei is doing this miracle. He goes back to the monastery where his uh, elder died the uh, day before. And we talked about last time how it was hot and sunny and all these many people there in the cell. And so therefore, all the natural ingredients were there for the body to smell. So it was an objective reality. So now he comes back at night. What happened? Windows are open. It's cool. There is no, nobody other than uh, another monk there. And there is no talk about the smell. So, you know, the smell is gone because it was the uh, product of, uh, you know, natural circumstances. And not, but everybody is was waiting for supernatural miracle for, you know, when you are 80 or 100 degrees in the room, all of a sudden the body has to smell like, the dead body needs to smell like flowers. And, you know, and this book is sort of against this expectation of supernatural. Uh, well, anyway, he comes back, it's, uh, cool and nice and they're reading the uh, the gospel and what's what's the reading that they're doing do you remember mm -hmm. i mean the title of the chapter is kind of, of galilee no we oh. already passed that mm -hmm. so they're reading about the f again that story is only in the gospel of john right. it doesn't it doesn't exist in the uh, other three mm -hmm. and <coughs> the the miracle of at the wedding of Cana where the water is transformed into wine and it is the first miracle that ever took place because even if you take the other gospels the first miracles that were happening there would happen at a later stage of Jesus's life so this is you know by all accounts you know at least the first miracle that we know of and therefore we have this first miracle that Jesus himself performed and that's supernatural trans if you take it literally you know making water into uh, fermented sugars and, and the grape juice and, and things like that so we have the first miracle connected to the very latest that you know in the book's timeline just happened and the uh, now you know we'll see what connects it all, and I think you know by this time the the answer is uh, obvious that it's God, uh, it's God who is who is love that must be present in the first miracle, and even if people understood it supernaturally, le let it be, and in the latest one as well. For, for it to, uh, to take place <coughs> and uh, again just on uh, page 355 a couple of pages before the story what the devil says to Alexei is this they just loaded you with your elder so the elder is now acting through Alexei and now you fired your elder off at me you know when he did this uh, this miracle with with the woman, and <coughs> uh, basically, even though that there is a big difference between these two miracles, the essence of transforming the hopeless situation, the situation which seems to have only bad outcomes, the wine is gone at the wedding, you know, it's party is over. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, obviously the, the two destructive choices that Grushenko was facing, the essence of the miracle was not the physical transformation, but that all of a sudden people saw a new possibility and the light was turned on and, and the life was made better and, and people were made happy, so to speak. Uh, and again, 
then it doesn't require so the the, the supernatural the, the the sort of going against the laws of nature is not a necessary requirement for a miracle to take place you know it can play take place in the inner world of uh, of human minds and the acting force what the what is acting in all of those miracles uh, is love. is love yes and it's God uh, so uh, in the next move Dostoevsky is showing how this force is transmitted through generations you know starting with Christ and his apostles so on page 369 Zosima is performing Hyretonia on, on Alexei and well of course it's uh, metaphorical you know it's not literal but so he comes into the cell and he sees that dream he sees his elder who is you know physically dead by now and the elder raised Alosha a little with his hand and Alosha got up from his knees I've never witnessed uh, you know somebody being made bishop but presumably that's what happens that you know at a certain stage that person is on his knees receiving the blessing from you know the existing bishop or somebody who's transferring this apostolic succession on him <coughs> and this is what he says why are you marveling at me <coughs> I gave a little onion and so I'm here and there are many here who only gave an onion only one little onion what are our gifts and you quiet one you meek boy we were able to give a little onion to a woman who hungered begin my dear begin my meek one to do your work so you know he's being you know metaphorically given this love this power to you know transmit it himself and being sent into the world to now become the agent of this power and 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 what does he said at the end? And do you see our son, S-U-N, with a capital? Do you see our son? Do you see him? What he is referring to here, you know, obviously, Jesus Christ, you know, is the, uh, is being referred to as, you know, the son uh, throughout the ages. And now, therefore, it becomes obvious why I mean it's <laughs> the picture is here for a reason because we witnessed that at least 10 times or maybe more throughout the book we have this image of the slanting rays of sun when the sun is setting when the person is being baptized when the person is having a religious experience this image keeps on coming up meaning that you know the God is being present and because when the sun is setting, setting and the rays are slanted all of a sudden rather than being invisible you can see them as, as, the, as the actual rain and the God becomes uh, visible in, uh, in those instances uh, and another thing the touch that the elder had to touch him you know, and then get him up from his knees is also a necessary uh, condition because this is the special kind of knowledge. It's not, it's different from what you get when you go to school or study on your own. When you have uh, some sort of mediator, you know, you read a text that somebody has written or you look at, I don't know, graph or picture. There is always some sort of medium between you getting that knowledge and the knowledge being out there here you know by the fact that you you know they were required to have a physical contact you know it it, it, it conveys direct and uh, uh, you know like unmediated and this is what experience and this is what often in orthodox church we call mystical experience but mystical means as uh, I just said, there are two types of knowledge. Mystical doesn't mean magical. It's not that it's something supernatural or, or you know, like uh, in the circus, some sort of magic. 
or mystical in this context and from the beginning what mystical means is the direct knowledge knowledge that you do not receive uh, by reading the text or listening to me or having some sort of thoughts or ideas but it sort of it like enters you directly there is nothing in between you having this knowledge and yes father Tom. you're not you're gonna call it theosis I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I oh don't yeah, think I know you. enough to, to call it anything, but I'm just <laughs> trying to stress that objectively it's not like something that we made up, but this is objectively two kinds of knowledge that exist. And unfortunately, in the West, but everywhere actually nowadays, everybody is limited to this mediated knowledge, the knowledge that we receive in school, in universities, and everything else. And kind of, and when people also hear mystical knowledge, they're like, oh, you know, it's this hocus pocus, who knows, who knows what it is. But, <laughs> but this is the real thing. And that's, that's basically, it, it, you know, even the Greek philosophers 3,000 years uh, ago knew that you know the the knowledge consists of these two types that you there are some things that you know directly mm -hmm. and then there are some things that you learn through you know process and some some medium so it, was, it was reached the enlightenment so or enlightenment you know, or theosis you know and then now you know it instantly it's there and again it's not when you will try to express it in words it loses this but meaning that it was that. direct. It, you know, it, 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 the, it all of a sudden it evaporates. You, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start speaking about it or thinking about it or, you know, having words, you know, it becomes not mystical anymore. I guess that's the... Uh, is that somewhat clear? There's a, there's a story <laughs> in uh, the... Uh, interview with St. Seraphim of Sirach where he's aware um, I can't remember the guy's name now. Malifala. Yeah. Huh? Malifala. Anyway, yes. he, he was interviewing <laughs> him uh, basically when he experiences this kind of knowledge that you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. And mm -hmm. he calls it, I mean, whatever you want to call it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's what all the apostles had. It's again, but again, no matter how what words he would use and how he would try to describe it we yeah. can only get vague pictures and, and probably not unless any, anything yeah exactly unless you were right there having right the same experience with him you will you like should not be able to understand Material. exactly what it was in real life so actually uh, from what you're describing it sounds like um it's fairly individualized, though. I, I'm, in other words, the soul not necessarily. I mean, it's subjective, uh -huh. but it, it there is nothing to say that we can have similar subjective experiences. You mean together all at once, or yeah. separately about the same thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I, I'm I mean, I've been in church before services when everyone was astounded mm -hmm. and. The only thing you could call it was the presence of God or something along those lines. Nobody can describe it, but people have had an experience in a mm -hmm. moment. But you're right. As soon as you start to describe it, mm -hmm. it, it loses the mysticism. It loses that mysticalness. Well, because that's the definition that this. Then it becomes this second type of knowledge, not the mystical, but mediated, the one that we have in school. As soon as you start to have some sort of descriptor mm -hmm. other than being there and, and having it. Is that the truth that is coming into you that you understand and you accept Oh yeah, but because uh, compared to any uh, mediated knowledge, the mystical knowledge is like the best that you could ever hope for because then there is no distortion, there is no uh, you know, there is no uh, nothing that could make it untrue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what uh, is true. 
you could yeah you could you could say that so what therefore he said, like, like the, 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 the the truth the that is coming to us absolutely. that we understand and we accept it like when we say in truth he is risen that yeah. is, that's the kind of okay. truth that she is talking about when we say uh, at Pascha in, in truth he is risen so therefore you know this this physical contact that there is this requirement that these the old bishop, so to speak, and the new bishop share a certain life and share a certain experience through which, you know, this power of God, God's love, agape, is being transferred from generation to generation. Mm. And, <laughs> and, and this is basically what is taking place here. And so now, that happened, you know, we have one page left before the uh, next book. And uh, just as a side note, all up until this point, I all the action was taking place in some sort of, uh, you know, rooms, uh, buildings, everything was indoors. Everything was indoors. And this is the first outdoor scene. And unfortunately, I can't remember exactly, but I've read lives of some of the Optina elders, and one of them describes how he had this experience which changed him and made him become, a, become a monk. And, yeah. and we talked earlier how Dostoevsky actually went and visited his two times and, and they had a conversation, but basically this first outdoor scene, this experience of God is pretty much uh, Taking from uh, Elder Ambrose's description of of of, well, of, of, of his con conversion, will be uh, this again. So this is again everything before that was black and white and gray indoors, and this is all of a sudden the movie becomes in color. And uh, he did not stop on the porch either, but went quickly down the steps filled with rapture in his soul and yearned for freedom and space vastness. Well, or it hit yeah, the yeah. heavenly dome full of quiet shining stars mm -hmm. on the boundless sea. From the so limits of the second. horizon the silver Milky Way stretched the stubble stream. Night, fresh and quiet, almost so still and, 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 and yeah, enveloped the earth. The white towers and golden domes of the church gleamed in the sapphire sky. Mm -hmm. The luxuriant autumn flowers in the flower beds made a house of balm the secret for morning. The science of the earth seemed to merge with the science of the heavens. The mystery of the earth touched the mystery of the stars. While Yasha stood gazing in suddenly as if he had been cut down, threw himself to the earth. Thank you. Do you allow the reader? Sure. <laughs> now what do I read? Same, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah. From here to here. Okay. Sorry, Frederick. <laughs> he did not stop on the porch either, <laughs> but went quickly down the steps. Filled with rapture, his soul yearned for freedom, space, vastness. Over him, the heavenly dome, full of quiet, shining stars, hung boundlessly. From the zenith to the horizon, the still dim Milky Way stretched its double strand. Night, fresh and quiet, almost unstirring, enveloped the earth. The white towers and golden domes of the church gleamed in the sapphire sky. The luxuriant autumn flowers in the flower beds near the house had fallen asleep until morning. The silence of the earth seemed to merge with the silence of the heavens. The mystery of the earth touched the mystery of the stars. Alyosha stood gazing and suddenly, as if he had been cut down, threw himself to the earth. Thank you. That was one just for all these people to not see. Otherwise, you didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and this is, you know, just if you look at it, this is right in the middle of the book. So this is like, you know, the pinnacle and the most important stuff and the most important scene, the most important chapter of the most important book. So if, if it's right there in the middle, you kind of know, you know, that it's important you have to uh, pay uh, attention so and <coughs> so you know he has this experience 
and how now next thing we're going to be told you know how God is present you know in our world and, and, and how we can you know maintain his presence and again it's been quoted a few times already in the book the, the from Matthew when Jesus said to uh, his disciples when two or more of you are present into my name I'll, I'll be there so what Dostoevsky calls this situation a uh, world of God. Well, it's sort of a special world that is being created when you have more than one, I guess two or more uh, people who who have this mutual uh, feeling being present, therefore Christ himself is being present, and then, you know, in this situation, world of God uh, is created. And then, of course, all of them, since God is present, are connected, well, the web metaphor hasn't existed then, so he calls it the ocean of love, as the totality of all those things. That, that's the whole world that, that the God has created. And that's, you know, has much more significance and meaning beyond just the, the physical world uh, that exists around us. So, you know, he gets up and what he feels, it, it was a, if threads from all those innumerable, innumerable worlds of God all came together in his soul, it was trembling all over, touching other worlds. So, when you are connected to this network, if to continue the metaphor, you will you're connected to you know all the other people who are engaged in this uh, uh, con you know, special behavior and uh, special feeling and <coughs> I think that given that we spent some time uh, on the like overall overview this is the end of the book seven things just you know gonna quickly go downhill from here uh, all the troubles will unravel uh, quickly so next time for the first time we'll actually cover two books in same day so next one will be eight and nine you know that will have to do with uh, what was it was that uh, uh, Saint Theodora right who went through all this heavenly gates where sh her soul was tried the, to the toll booth yeah so that's we're gonna see some of that uh, well Dostoevsky's version of that next time you know the uh, concept it sounds like anyway mm -hmm. when you connect it to the Afghan elders um, there's this um, priest in the, in, in, the, in the biography of St. Ambrose there's a priest in that book. It's a real, it's a real, it's a real life, and he um, was out of this parish and was poor, and he was married to a poor woman, and he was very despairing, and he had given up praying altogether. And at one point, he decided to walk to Optinapustin, and so he walked there, uh, whatever a verst is, forty of them to that place, and uh, to Optin, and he went to see el see the el el the elders. And when he was walking in the gate of the elder skeet in Optina, Elder Ambrose saw him walk in without his cassock or anything on. He said, priest, go home, pray, and pray and make, make it warm. And so he went home really in despair. You know, he just gave up. And he got so bad that he couldn't even sleep in his bed because he kept getting rolled out by the demons every night. And so then finally, um, he uh, says, um, he goes back with his cassock on this time. As he's walking in the gate, Elder Ambrose says to him, 
priest, go home. Remember, wherever you are, wherever you are gathered, he is with you. Two or more are gathered in his name. And so that means even when you're by yourself, you can be gathered in Jesus Christ. And when he went back this time, he started doing an act as if the mother of God in the middle, and all of a sudden his church came full, and this guy became a wonder worker uh, himself, a wonder working priest who did these incredible things. I mean, not magic, but real kind of miraculous things. But uh, just, it sounded a little bit like that. That's, but that's a real well, story. we have a similar situation here because on the last line, Alexei, three days later, he left the monastery, which was also in accordance with the words of his late elder who had bidden him to sojourn in the womb. So he is leaving his Cossack in the monastery now with, uh, for the benefit of those who are new. That's another thing uh, we see here is this three stages of Christianity in this book. First one, when Jesus came, and it was this sort of such a outlandish and crazy idea that people thought you know it must be crazy or uh, there is some sort of head sickness you have a fever something is wrong with you how can you you know say all of those crazy ideas so then there was a monastery stage where you had to take it all in uh, make sense of it apply logic make it accessible to normal people but now that stage is over and Alex that was Zosimus so so to say, and now Alexei has to leave the monastery for the final stage of Christianity when you know, has to be taken out of the monastery and being uh, start acting in the world. Amen. All right, we're done. Yes. Everybody rise. Marsh <laughs> Prince. <laughs> 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 Yes, yes, yes. 